So I'm going to talk about MagSec, which is a standard for encryption on wired networks, wired LANs. Um, so, brief outline. Uh, first, I'm going to give you an introduction to what MagSec is and why you probably never heard of it. Uh, briefly describe the implementation I did for the Linux kernel, and 
show you why you would want to use it and how to use it. And a little bit about what remains to be done. So, <clears throat> first, what is MagSec? It's an IEEE standard uh, for encryption of our Ethernet LANs. Um, and you can use it to encrypt and authenticate all your traffic in the LAN using a Galois control mode with 128 bit keys. So, why would you want to use MagSec? Well, our security in LANs at layer 2 is not really good. Uh, you could have some rogue DHCPs, some rogue router advertisements, and it's pretty easy to do some ARP and NDISC spoofing. So, you might want to secure your LAN. Uh, IPsec is only at layer 3, so you cannot protect your ARP and NDISC traffic if you have untrusted links. Um, you can also use, you could also use MagSec in a cloud environment if you use VXLAN or Geneve. Uh, there's a, a there's more to do some encrypted VXLAN stuff, but uh, encryption for VXLAN would be only on the tunnel endpoints and not us, not in the VM. So the tenant in the cloud would not have control over the keys. So why would you want to do that? Um, on the other hand, with MagSec over VXLAN, the tenant has control of the keys. The encryption is done in the VM, and that seems much more reasonable. Uh, some MagSec concepts and architecture. So in MagSec, we have the secure channel, which is a unidirectional channel from one of your nodes to any number of other nodes. And for and a secure channel is supported by a sequence of overlapping secure associations. So the associations within a secure channels, channel, um, for every frame that is transmitted over MagSec, you will have to use a key. And the keys are, are linked to the secure associations. Um, and you have also a packet number that is used, for example, for replay protection. Um, next is a other important concept you will need is the security entity, which is the instant of the MagSec implementation. You could run multiple MagSec instances on the same node, even on the same network interface. And the uncontrolled port in IEEE terminology is the normal network interface that provides insecure service. And that's what you build MagSec on top of. Um, so, if you want to configure MagSec on your machine, once you have the implementation, you have two options. Uh, the first option is configure your keys yourself. So you set up, you set up your secure channels and your keys manually. And I, that's the example use cases I will show you later. The other option is to use an extension to 802.1x. So 802.1x will do the authentication between the nodes for you. And then you use the MagSec key agreement protocol. And that will allow discovery of other MagSec nodes within your network and set up of all the secure channels, secure associations, and exchange of keys. And it will also allow synchronization of packet numbers so that uh, you can uh, do replay, replay protection with up-to-date packet numbers. So MagSec can work with two different modes. Um, you will always have um, integrity and authenticity of your traffic. And you can also encrypt it if you want. The, so the um, default crypto algorithm that you use for MagSec is Galois counter mode AES. And that will provide you authentication, authenticated encryption with additional data. Um, so your entire MagSec payload from the beginning of the Ethernet header to the end of, of your payload is always authenticated. Um, and then your network administrator, as a network administrator, you can choose whether you encrypt the payload, say IP, IP header, then TCP, and whatever you have over that, or you don't encrypt it. And then you, that will determine if... Um, you use 
how the parameters for GCM are set up. Uh, other modes that you can use with MaxEC is validation modes for incoming packets. So the more, most secure mode will be strict validation. Anything that's not completely protected and properly um, validated, uh, cryptographically validated, uh, is dropped. That's not secure traffic, you just don't want it. You can have also check validation, which uh, if you cannot validate a frame, you accept it, but you mark it as, you count it differently in your network statistics. And you can disable validation and receive, and you accept everything that comes in. Uh, of course, if you have encrypted frame, fully encrypted frames, you cannot accept it if you don't have the uh, <coughs> keys that matches it. But if you're using authenticated only traffic, then you can accept this without the right key. So I talked a bit about replay protection. Uh, each MaxSec frame has a 32-bit packet number with it. And on receive you, the node may decide to validate the packet number against uh, its receive window. That's optional. If you don't want to enable replay protection, then just don't configure it. Uh, now let's look at the, at what the protocol looks like. So just to remind you of what a Ethernet frame looks like, destination, source address, and then your ether type, and whatever you have over that IP header and everything. So the protected frame, you add a sec tag at the beginning of the frame. At, before your payload, uh, the user, the ether type that we had before is part of the MaxSec payload, and you add a new MaxSec ether type. And at the end, you have the ICV, the integrity check value, um, which is the cryptographic signature. And if you encrypt your payload, then everything starting from the original ether type of the packet will be encrypted. <laughs> so the sec tag here, I put the ether type here. You, um, so there's the tag control information first. I will describe what's in there later. Uh, the association number, since you have um, a sequence of, uh, of secure associations, um, you need to put the association number here so that the receiving node can choose which key to use in the, on the receiving um, to decrypt the packet. The association number is two bits, so you can have at most, you have a sequence between, you loop over your four association numbers and when you, when you get to the end of one association, then you switch to the next one. Uh, then there's the short length field, which indicates that the frame was under 64 bytes. And you have an optional secure channel identifier. Uh, it works a bit like a VLAN tag. So you can have multiple secure channels at the same time. And so the secure channel identifier is composed of the MAC address of the host that sent the packet and a 16-bit port number. Uh, the contents of the TCI fields, uh, you've got a few really interesting bits here. The SC bit indicates that the SCI, which is optional, was actually in there. And then you've got the encrypted payload bit that tells you if the payload was encrypted or not, and the change, state bit, change text bit, uh, which is which also helps you detect that, uh, for example, since the ICV length is not fixed, is not defined by the standard. If you don't use the default ICV length, you would set this change text bit. Uh, now, how MaxEC interacts with VLAN. If you want to have your VLAN header protected by MaxEC, then that's what you would do. You would have your Ethernet header, VLAN header, and then your data. And you would put all the VLAN plus VLAN header plus data inside MaxSec, inside the MaxSec payload, and that would end up being encrypted. Now, how 
packets are handled and when you transmit a packet, um, you've got your Ethernet header and data coming from the network stack on your machine. And you would push a sec tag at the, at the beginning, like you do with a VLAN. Then you compute and append the ICV for, for the packet, and you pass it down to the underlying device, say your normal network. On receive, it's a bit more complicated because you have to verify the packet. Uh, so you get the same packet that you transmitted before. You first verify that the packet and sec tag format are correct, that you didn't have some wrong, completely wrong things in there. And then if you enable replay protection, you would check that the packet number is correct. Otherwise, you don't, you just drop the package, you, so you don't give any feedback to a potential attacker. And that would help defend against DOS attacks because you don't want to spend a lot of time doing cryptographic validation on a packet that is obviously not correct or that end up being delayed somewhere or something. Uh, then you decrypt and verify the ICV, and then you recheck the packet number uh, once it has once the site tag has been validated as being sent by a trusted node. Then you remove the ICV and the site tag, and you can have a normal packet that you can send up to your network stack. Now I'm going to give you a few details of the Linux kernel implementation. Um, so the, um, the way a MaxEc device would, you, Max, MaxEc would you look like once you configure it on your machine is that that creates a new network device, like your network card, or like you would have for if you set up a VLAN on your machine. And the um, master device, which is the device under which your <coughs> Mac site node, uh, the device that has access to the real LAN that you have, will see only the raw packets, which is the uh, all your protected traffic. And the um, Mac site slave device will see only the normal friends. And you may also have some non-protected traffic on your LAN, for example, um, 802.1x will go on the unprotected on the unprotected interface before you have actually set up your device. And this model is actually a very good match for the uncontrolled and controlled port model that the IEEE standard uses. Um, and for those who are interested in the Linux kernel, uh, it uses RX handler and the net device operations like most, uh, like like my like my VLANs. Uh, the, on the crypto side, we just use the normal crypto API for the from the kernel that provide. So we already have we already had all the authenticated encryption implementation available, and it can also use the use hardware acceleration if your CPU if your CPU has it, which. I think most recent Intel CPUs at least have. Um, on the configuration side, uh, we use uh, both RT Netlink and GE Netlink. Uh, RT Netlink is what you use to create your net, your usual net devices, and GE Netlink provides the um, configuration of all the very MaxX specific things like the secure associations. And GE Netlink is really nice for that because it provides good um, demultiplexing capabilities, so it makes for a quite clean API. So I'm going to give you some use cases and configuration examples. Um, the configuration examples rely on IP route, which is um, the way to configure networking stuff nowadays. And if you're not very comfortable with IP root, Phil is going to talk about it soon, and you should go see his talk. Um, so suppose you have your you have your LAN with the in black you will have the physical links 
So you have a few hosts and the switch. Um, you have two ways basically to configure MagSec. The first way would be to configure MagSec on the hosts and on each of your switch ports. But for that, you will need a switch that has MagSec support. If your switch doesn't have MagSec support, you can still use MagSec between, between the hosts directly. And the switch would see only the MagSec protected traffic. So if you don't trust your switch, that's also the way to go. So here are a few comments that tell you how to bas do basic MagSec configuration. You create IP, IP link add link on your normal network interface ETH0. And you create the MagSec0 device with the type MagSec. Um, then you create a transmit secure association with a key and packet number, initial packet number. The packet number will grow after that. Um, you need also to create a receive secure channel for, the, for your peer. And you use, so, you use the max address of your peer, or the peer machine and the port, the port number by default, which is one. And on that secure channel, you need to create the receive, the secure receive, the receive secure association with the key that matches the um, We need, we need um, so you have key one on the on transmit for the second host and key one on receive for the second host. Um, some important configuration parameters that you would like uh, when when you have exhausted your when you get close to exhaustion of your packet number from the. Um, for one secure association, you need to set up another one because you don't want to reuse the same packet number with the same key. Um, so you set up a new secure you set up a new secure association with a, with a fresh key, and um, you switch secure associations. Oh. So. With that, you would uh, enable the next secure association. Um, you can enable encryption. Um, by, so by default in the kernel implementation, the um, encryption is not enabled. But if you create your link, and then you can later set it up to encrypt. You can just do that, switch, switch it on and off at any time. That's not a problem. You can also put this encrypt on bit right here when you create the device. Ah, yeah, that's IP root syntax. And to enable replay protection, that would be with replay on and the size of the receive window that you want, uh, depending on your LAN or you may want a oh, different to play with. Um, so that was a basic setup with one secure channel. If you want to have multiple secure channels, for example, because you don't want host one and host two to be able to see each other's uh, traffic with host four, so you want a separate separate uh, keys for the communication between host one and four and for host one and two. Then you would set up a secure channel that's between host one and four and a different secure channel between host two and four. Uh, so nodes one and two have only one secure channel. It's the same configuration as before, but host four has, no, has two secure channels. And you, you can use completely different cryptographic parameters. You can use encryption with one and only um, authenticity for the second one, for example. That's comple completely separate. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. So that's mostly the same configuration as before. Uh, you create your Maxic device, you create your transmit secure association, and you receive your secure channel to communicate with host one, and, you're, and on the, for host two you create with the MAC address of host two. The only difference between these two is the port number because you cannot have two transmit channels with the same port number. And on host two, then, when you create the uh, when you create the receive secure channel on host two, you would have to use that port number here <coughs> instead of one. You use port number two. Um, so I talked a bit about using VLANs over MaxEC earlier. Suppose you have one, you have your physical link between host one and host two. There may be a switch in there, it doesn't matter. You can create a secure channel. You can create one, one MaxEC device and a second MaxEC device <coughs> and have your VLANs over the MaxEC devices. So you would create your, Max, your VLAN devices on top of the um, on top of the MaxEC devices instead of creating it directly on top of ETH0. So that's what it looks like. You, fir you first create your MaxEC device over ETH0. You configure it like you did before. And then you create your VLAN, your VLAN device over MaxEC. And if you have a second one, then you create a new VLAN. Oh no, that's sorry. Uh, that's the two peers for VLAN one, and then you create your second VLAN. So now you create a new, a new secure channel on your host with a new port number, and then on top of that MaxEC device, you create your VLAN. You can also use MaxEC with bonding bonding devices, so link aggregation. Um, so suppose you have your two hosts, host one and host two, with each a bonding device, and you have three physical links between the two. Um, MaxEC would not be configured over the entire bond, but over each individual link. And then you put each individual MaxEC device in your bond. So that's you enslave the MaxEC devices, not the real links. Which means that your LACP control traffic is going to be protected by MaxEC. So you create a configuration, you create your bond. That's up to you. Then you set up MaxEC on each of your bonding link. So that's same kind of configuration as before. And then you enslave all your MaxEC devices in your bond. I put only two here, but you choose. Um, now, for MaxEC with VXLAN setup, uh, suppose you have your you have an underlay network for your for your cloud, and you have your virtual switches that are provide that are so that part is controlled by your um, cloud provider. And in your cloud, you have two tenants, A and B, which have some virtual machines on each side of the cloud. And they have their, they, each of the tenants have their own VXLAN to know. Uh, so tenant A, tenant A has the blue channel, and tenant B has the yellow or orange channel. And tenant A decides that they want to have a MaxEC. They want to use MaxEC over there because they don't really trust their cloud provider. They want to encrypt their traffic. So they would configure MaxEC over the over VSLAN, <coughs> and that's what a packet going through the underlying network would look like. You would have Ethernet header, then IP header, UDP, and VSLAN, and then the same. Same thing I showed earlier with the Ethernet header and SecTag. All this part is created by the 
by in the virtual machine of the tenant, and all that is added by the virtual switch from the from the cloud provider. Which means that all the cryptography is done, all the security uh, is done by the tenant himself, and they don't have to rely, they don't have to trust their cloud provider. So if you want to set up an example like that, that, that would be normal VXLAN tunnel creation using IP root, but if you're just a cloud customer, you don't set up your VXLAN tunnel yourself. And then you would just create your maxic link over the VXLAN tunnel that is provided to you. And that was completely transparently, you don't even have to, it doesn't matter if it's VXLAN tunnel, it just, it would just go, go well. Um, so, in conclusion, I'm going to tell you a bit about what remains to be done for MagSec. Um, in the kernel, for now the implementation doesn't have the optional features, some optional features of MagSec. Uh, one of these features is a confidentiality offset. Uh, you could decide that the first 30 bytes of your packet are not, are not encrypted, are only integrity protected. For example, so you are, you c that means that your IP header would be visible to the switches in the middle. And there's also um, an additional cipher suite that has been standardized, which uses uh, 256 bit keys. Um, I know that at least some Intel IXDB, so 10 gig NICs, have hardware support, have support for hardware offloading, but that's not yet implemented. But that would allow to, the, these NICs can do MaxEc at the full 10 gig line rate, which is uh, not something we can do with the current Linux kernel implementation. So we're looking for, we're looking to implement this hardware offloading and also to have some performance improvements so that you can use MaxEc with better buff. Uh, in user space, for now, I have only IP root support, but network manager support would also be interesting. And WPA supplicant already has uh, MK, so MaxEc key exchange support, um, but it's not yet, you cannot yet use it to configure the Linux kernel implementation. Um, that's something we will do. We'll do soon. And um, if you have any questions, uh, please. Okay. So I would like to ask, uh, what is the performance uh, of the link secured with my site? I heard it. Um. I don't remember exactly the last measurements. Um, Most I was running also with uh, debugging features enabled, so that also kills a bit your performance. But, uh, where I was not at one gig yet. But uh, I don't think I was using a lot uh, um, <laughs> the crypto extensions from the CPU. Okay. So. It depends. I think it depends more on your, on the. If you have 10 gigs, then we are very far from that for now. Yeah. If you have a one gig link, we're probably not too far. talk about Intel because Intel uh, has published their specifications and we yeah. can implement it. Uh, other companies, I don't have any specification though, so. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we would have to rely on them doing that. Do you know, do you know if the Intel implementation is uh, compatible, say, with TSO, the, can you pass it with each frame and with, with segments and with segments? Um, not sure. The key exchange is uh, an extension to 802.1x. It's this MKA Maxec key agreement protocol. Um, so you you do authentication with 802.1x, and then the Maxec the, um, the MKA clients with can exchange keys between themselves. Forgot to. Oh. Oh, yes. Is there already any adoption or acceptance from other vendors like Cisco? Like um, I think Cisco has an implementation. Uh, Juniper has an implementation. Um, Brocade, I think, also has implementation in some of their switches. So there are some. You so can. It's on the way. You can you can get it in other places. What's the point of uh, you when you use VLAN? The VLAN header is protected by Maxet. That means also switch you must put it on VLAN in the middle of it if you want to. Otherwise you cannot so switch the VLAN on the right port because they don't encrypt the VLAN. Um but you get the VLAN once you decapsulate at the at the other end. You can you can also um, so you can also put the VLAN on the other side of the seg tag, but if you want to encrypt your VLAN traffic, your VLAN tag, you can. It works. It works both ways. You can you can do it both ways. You can have a VLAN either after the seg tag or before. Okay. And in some cases you can the switch terminate actually the max set connection. So the switch is able to decrypt the packet and use the VLAN IP and re-encrypt it again. It is the max set. Some switches do that is. Sorry. Yes? I'm interested in the key third type. Now I'm used to know that it said basically IPv4 or 6, and now it says MaxSec. Yes. So the information IPv4 or 6 then moved to the second tag? It's moved to after the second tag. That's that's the origin. That's your IP as a type. It's here. Yes. I'm doing polling with LCP, hmm? which you usually do also when I'm polling. Sorry. The question is, we usually do one polling and then doing VLANs uh, over the that polling. Hmm? How it fits to this? Because I see that you have to do uh, accept over each interface. Yes. Then so you configure your VLANs over your bond. What? Yeah, it's it's just a network device in Linux and. But, but in that case, I, I need to have that for for maximum switching. Because this okay, this is this is linked between the uh, the bond link between the hosts. But usually I have I have uh, normal switching connection. So in that case, if I would like to have protected bond. I must have probably the switch with the with the mask itself. Yeah. If you have one yeah, if you have uh, a switch in one side of your to be one of your bonds, then yeah, it would need max X support. So is this possible to design over the top bond
Um, I suppose it's possible to make MagSec work over your bond, but I haven't looked at that. <laughs> That's the, um, the setup I... You do it this way. You have protected also the LSD. Yes, yes, yes. So if I am looking, you should make it MagSec, and you don't need to go. Yeah. So you do that to go into over the bond. And let us I I suppose you could do that. I haven't looked at it. I don't see a reason that wouldn't work, but I cannot promise you anything about that. Is there any impact on latency? You know, for encrypting and decrypting? Um, things are growing, Um, I haven't done measurements on that, but yeah, probably it's going to. I have a question. So. If uh, how it works with variable MTU and if large MTU is also supported, like uh, if, it's, if it's okay with it? I like I don't see any reason that wouldn't work. Um, MagSite, MagSite basically needs only uh, an Ethernet header and an Ether type, so maybe. wanted to know if you can use MagSec with an un unsecured Wi-Fi network. Uh, so MagSec really needs mostly a uh, full Ethernet header with an Ether type. So possibly it could work. I can no, I can really test that right now. But sorry. Yeah, also should 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 possibly. Yes. This might be a specific question, and we probably ask that in your presentation. But why do we need this, and why do we don't use stuff that we already have, but for wireless? Like, why don't we use VPN for wireless communication? Because you, if you have an unsecure network, that you you didn't configure it yourself, you just use what's here. Um, if you have a network that you didn't configure yourself, you're just in a hotel or something, then maybe you want to secure traffic with your friend in another room, then okay. yeah. that would be the reason for... IP sake of a max sake if you want. But
Let's talk so far on that stuff conf. Your, your talk was probably the best talk I saw so far on the DevConf. 